Hey guys, I'm Philip Molina and this is a completely different space than where we normally shoot. We're in the middle of some changes and some moves and nothing is set up yet. The audio might sound kind of echoey and I'm sorry about that. Don't judge me on it yet. I'm getting it all figured out, but the next few videos are going to look a little different and sound a little different. That aside, let's go ahead and get into this video. It's a breakdown of The Walking Dead Season 6 Episode 11, Knots Untie. And we finally see the hilltop and meet the douchiest leader ever, Gregory. It's a really big episode for Abraham and Maggie so let's get right into it with the opening images. So right away we see Abraham and Sasha and he catches a glimpse of some kids running around and it makes him say this. Brave new world. But what does he mean by that? Well, Brave New World is a 1932 novel by Aldous Huxley. It's about a dystopian future, kind of post-apocalyptic society where, like Abraham and Rosita do, everybody just has recreational sex all the time. That's just their thing to do. And the idea of having babies and building a traditional family is just totally unheard of. So tying this back to Abraham, well, he knows now that Maggie and Glenn are bringing a baby into this brave new dystopian world. And that seems totally crazy to him. And for pretty good reason. I mean, Rick and Lori had the same fears about Judith back in season two, and it's just obvious, a zombie apocalypse is no place for a baby. See, Sasha is suggesting that because this world is so crappy, that's all the more reason to create a new future to look forward to, and Abraham can't wrap his ginger head around that. But I also love how Abraham has this war story about a camel eating his keys, and here's the thing, this is the second story that Abraham has told about war and a camel having something up its ass. Coming up a dune, there's this camel, looks like it's about to puke. Probably because shitbirds packed about four pounds of C4 up its ass. He just loves these camel butt stories. Sasha then reveals that she's not gonna go on these patrols with Abraham anymore and that Eugene is gonna take her place. And that's bad for two reasons. One, so much for Sasha and Abraham's budding romance, at least at the moment. You can see they literally go down two different paths representing their different points of view. But also, ugh, second reason, if you read the comics, you know Abraham and Eugene going on patrols, it's not a great idea. It's kind of a recipe for disaster. And I cringed when I saw that they're gonna get paired up together. Together. That's all I'm gonna say about that, but ugh, that might not go so well. Then right after Abraham and Rosita have probably just boned, uh, you can tell that he's still thinking about the way he left off with Sasha. He's getting flashes there and they gave each other the peace sign. So something you might have missed here is that this is a reference to Forrest Gump, where Forrest is dressed in his Marine uniform and he's saying goodbye to the girl that he's supposed to be with. And Abraham obviously is a soldier too. So when they each hold up peace signs, it's actually ironic because a soldier holding up a peace sign doesn't exactly make sense, but that's because it's not meant as a political statement. They're both just kind of simple-minded guys that are wondering what it would be like to see the world the way the these ladies do. By the way, that is Claire Underwood there. Crazy, right? But then going back to the post-coital sex scene for a moment, and not to be gross, but they say that the moments after sex is when a guy is thinking his most clearly. So the fact that Abraham is flashing back to Sasha at this moment, when he's finally not thinking with his wiener, that tells us where his heart really is and who's really on his mind. Obviously it's Sasha. And that makes it so much sadder when Rosita gives him this adorable little thing she made at camp. This arts and crafts necklace out of a broken brake light. And do you get that by the way? She's not being so subtle. Hey, let's take our foot off the gas. Let's stop running. Let's settle here. Put the brakes on. And when he's like, you're damn near perfect. And she says, show me. She's demanding that Abraham return her affection, prove it back to her, and based on his oh shit face, yeah, I don't think he wants to take that step with her. Moving on, Glenn and Maggie are trying to grow more tomato crops to fix Alexandria's food shortage, which shows us that even though this town is totally succeeding actually right now, it's still literally starving. So yeah, they're living more and better than they ever have before, they're still technically dying. So that's just another interpretation of that phrase, the walking dead. They're living and dead at the same time. The tomato crops themselves are also a symbol of Maggie's concerns for the health of her own little baby tomato in her belly, technically. Uh, but uh, Glenn reassures her that it'll grow. And he's obviously, yeah, talking about the plant, but the subtext here is that he's talking about little tomato baby. By the way, his talk about plants growing is this week's Glenn likes to be like Christ moment because Christ uses a really similar metaphor about seeds and 
fertile grounds and yada, whatever. It's all in the Gospel of Matthew. You get it. Glenn be like Christ. Let's move on. Then we see the other Jesus in Rick's house. And if you look at that painting, it's of the Queen of Spades. And in the game of hearts, the Queen of Spades is a bad card that you do not want to get. If you get it, you, you'll probably lose that round. But there's this strategy called shooting the moon. And it's a, it's a very big risk, but if you play it right, it can really pay off for you. So here, Rick and Jesus are each other's queens of spades. Jesus is equally taking a big risk and trusting Rick, and Rick is taking a big risk and trusting Jesus. But if they pay off, it actually could be a huge win for both of them. Side note, I used to think that shooting the moon meant showing somebody your butt, but Rick also does that to Jesus too. Coral then gets the drop on Jesus and little missable moment right here. Carl used to be right-handed, but now that his right eye is gone, he switched to using his left hand so that he can line up his eye to the shot and aim correctly. It's a cool little detail to show that Carl's doing a good job adapting to this devastating injury. So good job, Coral. Also, I love how awkward the Rashon reveal was for everybody. Like Michonne can't even look at Carl right now. And also during this moment, Jesus is explaining how he escapes and he says, One guard can cover two exits with third floor windows. Knots untie and locks get picked. Right. And that's a literal version of the episode's title. We'll get back to deeper meanings about the title later. Also then, Rick and Carl have this father-son moment about Michonne and yada yada. I'm totally just distracted by this adorable little wave that Judith gives Carl when she sees him. Look at that. It's adorable. Oh, little baby tomato. Don't get eaten. The crew then hits the road in an RV and we get this amazing moment between Abraham and Glenn. When you were uh, pouring the Bisquick, you trying to make pancakes? Glenn, in this moment, he reminds me of a substitute teacher who is dealing with this perverted middle schooler in the middle of like sex ed, just cringing so hard. But anyway, the point here is that Abraham clearly thinks it's a bad idea to have kids right now. I see rain coming, I'm wearing galoshes. I double up. And I don't want to explain what the rain coming part of that metaphor means, but if the galoshes mean condoms, please, guys, do not listen to him. Do not double up your condoms. Latex on latex friction. It's a thing. Don't do it. Okay? Don't. Don't? Moving on. And then after saving some of Jesus' friends, the gang makes it to the hilltop. And this moment of the gates opening looks really cool. And it's almost exactly like the comics. In fact, the show's set designers think they use the comics as a blueprint to transform the cow pasture into a, a colony with mansions and trailers and gardens and livestock pens. Like they actually built this stuff for real. And it's clearly just good news and a great sight for future parents, Glenn and Maggie. Now the inspiration for the hilltop might have been this old Christian hymn, uh, Mansion Over the Hilltop. This is what the hilltop colony means for Rick and his crew. It's a real promise of salvation. Like in the song, it means heaven. But here, they no longer have to wander. They've found it. They're heaven. They're salvation. The streets are full of gold, except gold here is food. And if you found yourself wondering, why did these people have a sustainable colony when the Alexandrians are starving? Like, what did they do differently? Well, you gotta remember, Alexandria was designed as a community of tomorrow. They have all these solar panels. It's all fancy. But this place at the hilltop, it was around long before modern civilization and electricity were even a thing, it has a freaking blacksmith. So all this self-sufficiency is something that Rick needs to take back with them to Alexandria. And before we move on, I don't know if you caught this, but I was really creeped out by this little person crawling out of the corner of the frame. What is that? <laughs> Some people thought it was a crew member in the background trying to like duck down out of the shot. But if you look a few seconds earlier, you see it's just a creepy little kid playing in the grass. And then we meet Gregory, the so-called leader of the hilltop. And man, I already hate this guy so much. I'm the boss. Well, I'm Rick, we have a community. Why don't you all go get cleaned up? You don't cut off a guy who just cut off his girlfriend's hand and also tell him that he's dirty and stinks. It's hard to keep this place clean. Rick immediately wants to shoot this guy in the face, and so do I. So he passes off the negotiations to Maggie, and now Gregory's an even bigger dick. So remember, this whole thing is taking place in Virginia. So the Barrington house, this mansion that they're in, it could be a pre-Civil War plantation house that might have at one point had slaves. And isn't that kind of how Gregory is coming off? Like this old man who acts like he owns everything and everyone in this community. Like the way he talks to Maggie as if he owns 
loves her and he even literally offers her to exchange work and her service for feeding her which is the relationship you have with the slave except he clearly wants a much more gross slave-like relationship with her tell you i can make it worth your while let me stop you right there i hate his guts and i hope he gets what's coming to him oh so obviously i love this moment when rick is like yeah we're still gonna take what we came here for by any means necessary we want things too we need food came all this way we're gonna get it he said something really similar also when they first arrived to alexandria if they can't make it then we'll just take this place moving on to the returning hilltoppers who try to kill gregory for negan it all plays out just like it did in the comics but it ends in that great moment of the what which is uh this cool moment that andrew lincoln had told us like a year ago to keep an eye out for <laughs> wait for it in the back hay is what i'm saying wait for it and i don't know also if you caught this little missable moment here but as abraham is nearly dying he hears sasha's voice now earlier, Abraham almost chopped off this guy's head, Freddy, and that guy said that when he thought he was gonna die, he saw his wife's face. That's when I thought it was over. There she was. <laughs> So here, when Abraham thinks he's gonna die and he hears Sasha's voice pretty clearly to him, that reveals to him who he should be with, who's kind of the proper wife for him. And then when he's asking Daryl about Uggin Bumpleys in that other scene, we saw him tuck Rosita's little brake light necklace into his shirt, and now he leaves it in the freaking dirt. So he's clearly choosing Sasha and poor Rosita. Lo siento. We then learn from Jesus that Negan is basically Hopper from A Bug's Life. His whole policy is to steal half the food from another community, and he kills people to make a point. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. By the way, that's the voice of Frank Underwood right there. Crazy, right? Oh, also, uh, Jesus right there gave us a little reference to Negan's favorite weapon. Said we needed to understand right off the bat. She's coming. Then later, Maggie forces Gregory to accept their deal to take out Negan. And note how Gregory has no power now, and he's lying wounded in a bed, the weakest stance he could possibly have. And now Maggie stands over him with her hands on her hips, mimicking the power stance that he pulled before. Also, Gregory has to be the most selfish person ever. Nope, multiple people from the hilltop have been killed by Negan, and he only cares when he gets stabbed a little. Also, there's this moment where Maggie asks for one last thing. Do you want anything else? But I do want something. And we don't technically know what that was. I know a lot of people think that it could have been the sonogram she gets later, but the doctor already seemed pretty on board with helping them, so I didn't feel like she needs to ask for that. So for that reason, I kind of hope that it was that stupid painting that he liked so much. Because then it would be kind of like it was in Mad Men, if you saw that, when Peggy Olsen takes that painting to show everybody who's boss. Maybe a similar moment to that. I would just love to see that she took something away from him that he loves. Okay, and that brings us to our closing images, where they drive back an RV full of food, to Alexandria and remember the episode's title was knots untie and knots represent agreements and relationships between people well Maggie was able to untie the agreement that the hilltop had with the saviors which also temporarily solves Alexandria's starvation problem and later as that baby photo is being passed around and it gets to Abraham it's a visual callback to the opening scene when he was also looking at a baby essentially and wondering why kids should be brought into this brave new world and now, he finally gets Sasha's answer. Still can't stop thinking about Maggie having a pup. Maybe that's why. Because the way things go. The way things go, tomorrow is not guaranteed. And now is the only time to start building a better future. That makes Abraham untie his knot with Rosita, which was represented by her kind of noose-like necklace. And now he's hoping to build a new future with Sasha, maybe even tying the knot with her. Okay, lingering questions. One, what was that thing that Maggie wanted from Gregory? Was it the sonogram? Was it the painting? Was it something else that we haven't even seen yet? Like, I don't, like his freaking house or something. Let me know what you think in the comments. Two, do you think babies should be brought into the zombie apocalypse? Let me know what you think in the comments below too. And if you enjoyed this video, please share it with your other Walking Dead friends. Um, not your Walking Dead friends like they're zombies, but your friends that watch The Walking Dead. Anyway, hit subscribe if you want to see more of these. I know it's so frustrating when these videos don't come out when you want them to. We record them and then they get blocked. All we can do is do our best and get them unblocked as fast as we can. We're working really hard on it though so that you guys get to see this stuff 
stuff closer to when we make it. Hopefully it'll be figured out soon. You can always follow at New Rockstars for more information about just all that stuff and how our videos are coming out and when they're coming out. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Fimo and you can ask me any questions or chat with me on Twitter. I try to get back to as many people as I can. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll see you next time. Bye.